All right. How's it going, everybody? Back on uh, week two, trying to be as consistent as possible, as, uh, as difficult as that can be sometimes. This is your host, Beyond the Well. Welcome back, everybody. Austin Smedley, and I got uh, another guest that I'm happy to have on. Always a pleasure, Pat. How you doing? Doing all right, man. Definitely doing well. Uh, we were talking a minute ago. I think your background is much more fitting than mine. I, I, <laughs> I like the uh, I like all the uh, pageantry and stuff you got going on. Are you in your studio right now? Yes, yeah, this is actually my uh, my tattoo station right here behind me. That's awesome, dude. When did the uh, I know Vamachar is a pretty new development like this year? I'm sure. It yeah, took- I actually think um it was kind of in the works the last I was on the podcast. Um, uh, but it officially opened December sixth. But then, uh, so we were open for just a few months and then uh, COVID kind of hit. So, you know, it was uh, pretty early on that we got hit with that. But, you know, still afloat, coming back stronger than ever, you know. Yeah, dude. I mean, I can see if your social media pages or anything to tell. You guys have been plenty busy with all the stuff that you've got going on. Yeah, man. And, you know, uh, I had a shop manager for a good while um, on top of having uh, my apprentice and stuff like that. So, you know, having two employees on top of that and, you know, everything like that, everything's been really good. And then I've gotten a few other artists and stuff that have kind of become frequent co-collaborators around here, which has been really exciting. So, you know, everything's booming around here. That's awesome. I mean, we're still two opposite ends of the country, but we're still like a mess things are still in the process of opening back up where we, most of the restaurants and stuff, they have like little outdoor areas and seeing how it's been like 110 degrees here. I don't think anybody's going, but uh, yeah, it's been really interesting to see how this whole thing is unfolding. I know last week, uh, me and Christian, we were speaking about how being isolated the way that we have been this year has been a very fruitful time for creatives like being able to take a step back from everything and really analyze just how important their work is yeah 100 percent. i think it was kind of a rerouting and a, and a re figuring out whether or not uh you're actually on the path you want to be on you know it's like a lot of times some things are happening so damn fast all the time it's good to take a minute and be kind of forced to take it all in and, and figure out if you're actually like you know working towards those bigger goals that you're trying to get towards. I think even more so than just the goals, like one of the things that I uh, discovered uh, having taken a step back from this and some writing and stuff like that and focusing on other things, realize just how integral a lot of your artwork is to who you are. It's not just something that you do. It's actually an extension of who you are, which is what beyond the well is for me. And is tattooing the same thing for you and just art in general. Yeah, 100%. I think um, it it makes you double down on the fact that, uh, you know, like you kind of are your habits and the the actions that you do all the time. They kind of create you. And I think when they get tested and you double down on them and you find yourself doing whatever you can to kind of hold on to those routines, those habits and those actions that kind of like make you not only the most happiest, the most fulfilled, but kind of fulfilling that true will in a sense. Um, it really shows you that, no, this is who I am. And this is, you know, what I'm, you know, here to do if there is any sort of purpose, you know, in, in a, in a kind of existential way, as much as I think that uh, we kind of create that for ourselves. I think, you know, in those type of situations, you really get to see what you're made of and how strong your convictions are. Oh, definitely. I mean, the things that you decide to do naturally, like what just what you naturally take part in. I've been rereading a lot of uh, Christopher Hitchens stuff over the past like a uh, month or so. And that's something I continually find in his work as uh, even when he got cancer, there's a great video that was released uh, just a couple months before his death that I think you should watch. But he was talking about how he was undergoing radiation and it was basically kill. It was essentially killing him faster than the cancer was, which was a little ironic. But he uh, called, he's like, look, the only thing I'm afraid of is losing the ability to write. That's it. He's like, I, I, if I can't write, I'm already dead, which is such, yep. a, such a fantastic perspective to take on this. Um, if I can't do the thing that I naturally do, then what am I? Like, this is, this is my chosen vocation, but more so than that, this is how I communicate with the rest of the world. Yeah, man, I actually, like, I get pretty upset sometimes, you know, you try and put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and sometimes I try and think of, like, what, um, like, I mean, anytime I see, like, a UFC fighter's last fight of their career, for instance, I feel kind of upset, because I'm like, dude, how that must feel, like, and it happens so young, like, you know, that, like, 
the thing that you devoted your whole life to and now it's a wrap and you're gonna like you got to figure out some new direction to go and it's like you're you're not able to do that thing that probably was your guiding star all that time dude like an example of that i can think of um in team alpha male up in sacramento there was a fighter named chris holdsworth and he trained with like TJ Dillashaw. It was Uriah Faber's thing, but TJ Dillashaw, Cody Garbrandt, Chad Mendez, all those guys. And Chris was like brand new. This this kid was like his early twenties, around my age, and he was sparring, and he got hurt, and that ruined his career. That was it. Like that was the end. Like he was sparring with TJ Dillashaw, I think, and he got injured. And this kid was brand new. Like this was his life's purpose, and he was like shooting for it, and he got hurt, and that was the end of it. Like he never fought again. And I, that got me thinking the same thing too. I was like, dude, I mean, I know you have like coaching and stuff like that, but man, like losing that at such an early age to something that really wasn't even your choice. Like it just happened, just flash injury. And that's surprisingly common. I know one of my old coaches, um, he was a family friend, same thing happened to him. Like he would be fighting and fighting and then he would get hurt. And he's like, now I have to sit out for six months. And like, I guess I'm just going to go train some more or whenever I can. That, that loss of purpose is huge. Or even, I mean, just the, the kind of like enlightened Satori sort of moment that some of these fighters seem to have when they're like, no, I'm, I'm you know, in my late 30s, early 40s, and you know what, I'm going to hang in the towel. And it's like you watch these guys do it, but you can see the sadness on their face that they have to recognize that they're getting older and they can't keep doing this, you know? Mm. And you think about in how late people are living now, you're barely at middle age at that point. So the fact that like the thing that brings you the most joy is a wrap and you're not even halfway there yet. That's, that's wild. Just like, uh, I don't know if you saw the fights uh, a couple weeks ago, Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic, like that third fight that they had, Cormier was 41, I think like he had just turned 41 and that was his, uh, his situation. And yeah. for someone who was a, like a born champion, someone who held two division, like two belts and two divisions, Olympic level wrestler, he just, that was it. That I was mean, the dude, end. even, even um, in a, in a unrelated sport, but I mean, half Thor kind of calling it quits after winning, you know, uh, 10 strongman, you know, world's strongest man competitions and whatnot, him calling it quits kind of because of his health situation and that kind of thing, you know, choosing to be healthier, you know, wanting to get off of the performance enhancing drugs, I'm sure all that kind of stuff, but kind of, again, having to realize his own mortality and give up the thing that, and it seems like a dumb move on a lot of people's part because he's at the height of his game, but you know. Well, you're at the height of your game until nature decides that you're not anymore, especially when it comes to like physical sports like that. It's tragic to see because you have the flip side of that too. It's sort of the whole, the mind is running, like your, your, your spirit is alive and well, and it can keep doing this forever, but you're just, your physical state isn't going to be able to sustain the damage or like Michael Bisbing's another example, like someone who's a UFC champion a couple of years ago. And then he went on this crazy losing streak was about to lose the other eye that he had. And he's like, look, I can't do this anymore. Like I almost lost my other, my good eye, my last fight, I got knocked out. He's like, if I go back to this, there's a good, there's a good chance. I'm not going to have either one of my eyes. Like it's the willingness to sacrifice physical health for something that is so integral to who you are. Like I'm not, I don't fight. I'm a fighter. This is what I do. The transition to something else is, I can't even comprehend it because quite frankly, there's not a whole lot that can take me away from sitting down and talking to somebody. But if I broke my arm and I'm a, like a strong, crazy BJJ guy, oh man, that would, that would crush me. Yeah. And I think it, like as an artist, I mean, obviously like the situation with having to have your body sort of deteriorate, and not keep up with you isn't as much of an issue. But I think that the problem that a lot of artists have is like, they become comfortable and they're not hungry, which was the thing that like fueled their work in the first place. So I think for a lot of um, artists, as they get older, less sort of like lively and angry or like uh, pushed by external sort of things that they're reacting to, where you just lose that fire. It's like, you need to keep yourself uncomfortable and keep introducing sort of like uh, chaotic elements into you, you know, to keep you going, keep you, keep you sort of striving and keep you hungry. You know, maybe you're not starving, but you're still hungry. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that I came to realize after having taken a step back from this and a lot of the creative stuff that I was doing, it was such a part of me that I 
noticed like a gradual degradation in uh, who I was, my self-concept, my self-identity, all these different things started to kind of erode away. And I'm kind of, I'm ex- experiencing a lot more existential sort of crises more frequently, like just sitting back, like if I don't have this, then, then what am I? And the answer really isn't, isn't a whole lot because this is the way that you communicate with the world. This is the way you express yourself. This is the way that you basically free yourself from the prison that you end up putting yourself in if you're not doing it. Like it takes a pretty big change. And I think a pandemic might actually, you know, be fitting there, but yeah, it, it can take a big catastrophic oftentimes event to make you realize like, I don't know who I am anymore. I need to get myself back up and I need to figure out what's going on. Yeah. When it comes to tattooing, you mentioned a second ago, like fatigue is very common with artists. I've experienced it myself with writing and all these other things that I've done. Um, When it comes to drawing, painting, uh, tattooing, how is it that you, you mentioned the chaotic element. What does that look like to you? How do you introduce something fresh and something new to keep yourself hungry? Well, I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's always having big goals that seem like unachievable and then finding ways to chip away at them. You know, I think a lot of times guys set goals that are way too low and way too achievable. And then um, when they do achieve them, it's just kind of like, well, where do I go from here now? It's like, if you choose something that you never quite really even think is totally achievable, but you're going to strive after that as if it is anyway, it keeps you hungry and keeps you pushing. So even when you kind of climb mountains that most people would think, you know, like, Oh, okay. You could chill out now. You know, you're still like, no motherfucker. There's a big mountain even beyond this that I've, that I'm trying to get after, you know, and I might not even get to see the top of it before this sort of incarnation is up, but I'm going to try and get there anyway. I can't help but look behind you and notice a lot of the, aesthetics and reminders perhaps of the things that you admire just from an aesthetic point of view does that have at all anything to do with uh, keeping you motivated having idols and things that you can reflect back on 100 percent, man i think even in building this sort of shop that's kind of like an anomaly in the the tattoo scene you know having a kind of shop that's overtly kind of a a black magic shop is a lot of just like skulls and real bones and taxidermy and stuff around the shop and and things like you know i have a gravestone over there and um, you know, human spine, you can see behind me on the wall and stuff. I just got a, a scythe I have over in the corner and stuff. You know, there's like this reminder of, uh, of death and mortality and kind of like time passing, like, which I think is very potent and pertinent and kind of uh, keeps you on the ball with uh, art and keeps you present every day. But then also like, I think having these kind of things around because most people would rather be ignorant and not think about their own mortality, not think about the darker aspects of life, these sorts of things. Keeping that stuff conscious makes you necessarily an outlaw in that kind of way. And putting those things out front, putting them in your working area and putting them in a way where you can't really divorce yourself from them. You kind of uncomfortably, no matter who walks through that door, I have to answer for the things that I surround myself with. Um, and kind of own that this is my area, this is my place, and these are the things that I choose to associate with, it doesn't really give you much wiggle room to kind of entertain bullshit, you know, and and kind of do the dance of like the keeping up with the status quo that most people do and that sort of thing. It kind of keeps you honest and keeps you true to that path, you know, because if you're not, you're kind of carrying a lot of weight, you're carrying a heavy cross to try and put on a front to be somebody you're not but if it is authentic then it's kind of this constant meditation and having to own the person that you actually are and the path that you're on oh i think people surrounding themselves with bullshit and things that uh, are very vacuous and empty like the culture as a whole i think the past year has been an excellent example of what happens when that starts to crumble when people are left running around with like chickens with their heads cut off, uh, wear a mask here, sanitize this, sanitize that, because all of a sudden people are afraid. All of a sudden people can't walk outside without thinking, am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? Now you're starting to see people who perhaps never before are starting to realize those aspects of life, realize just uh, be, become aware of their own mortality, especially a lot of people within my age range, a lot of you know, yeah. college students, a lot of those bros who 
are now attending parties and are coming home and are dying within weeks because it's like, oh, I'm not invincible. Like all of a sudden you're aware of these things. I started picking up, you know, um, again, like books that I read, you know, maybe 15 years ago that seem much more pertinent now. And like, I'm starting to pick them up and kind of thumb through them again. One of which I was picking up the other day was Thus Spake Zarathustra, kind of Nietzsche. And flipping through and uh, kind of reading through some of Nietzsche's writings on slave morality, you know, and like kind of uh, it makes you a bit misanthropic, I think. And I went through a little period during this pandemic where I was thinking a lot about the fact that like as much as our generation seems to think that they're above a lot of this stuff, um, you start noticing that kind of the uh, the high morality of this kind of, yeah, slave morality, this um sort of fear-based like prey animal sort of like herd thinking that most people seem to be in and you know it's like I found myself more and more often finding other people who didn't seem to be giving into that herd and being like ah dude you're one of the rare ones you know like like keeping your head on straight and that sort of thing and I'm not you know I'm all for you know, uh, taking things logically and being cautious where it's necessary and being smart. But like, it seems like so many people were just falling for this thing or that thing or towing that party line and not questioning. And if anybody was questioning, people seem to want to shame and witch hunt that person, which I think is not productive. You know, it's like this stuff seemed to be as more political than it was even uh, about um, health, you know, mm. oddly enough, you know, a pandemic, you know, politicizing a pandemic. How silly, you know, the, this modern Kali Yuga age is. <laughs> how silly, but also how predictable. I mean, it's one yeah, of those 100%. things that you can see, especially when you're taking the cons like uh, slave morality and Nietzsche's writings and stuff like that, um, within, like in that realm. It's very easy to see how a lot of people who view themselves as above it, a lot of people who carry themselves and act like they're above it, are the first ones to clamor onto social media and trump up some cause that they don't even really know anything about. They're just kind of taking part in it. They're an observer. It's almost embarrassing that uh, social media posts have all of a sudden been uh, painted as like activism, like genuine activism. I'm a fan of passion. I, I, I've been able to, uh, like the night that all of these, like the George Floyd riots that were, and stuff that were happening in downtown LA, uh, I took a drive out there the very night that that started and I didn't even know. I was with a cousin of mine and we were driving and we just start, we look like the skyline and we see set like seven or so helicopters like flying in between the buildings and we're like oh it's getting crazy and yeah, dude, I saw a lot of tattooers that i know from downtown la posting a lot of like stories and stuff on instagram as it was happening and i was like really uh kind of worried for a lot of friends i had out there and stuff and hope everybody was uh staying safe it looked like it was some pretty wild bedlam out there yeah, it was definitely. We were able to hear some of it. We weren't, uh, we actually took a drive through like Rodeo Drive, like the nicer part, like towards Beverly oh. Hills. And within like four hours after we had left, they looted the place. Like it was destroyed, like within hours of us being there. And I think it's a, it's a reflection of the frustration and the anger that people have been holding in for the past several years. I think, quite frankly, this was bound to happen. Like things like this just, they tend to happen. You look historically riots are nothing new, but whether or not they're justified, it's interesting to watch. It's interesting I mean, to I see was, everything go down. I was there. I have a bunch of uh, drawings and stuff like that from when I was uh, at the Occupy Wall Street um, riots um, or not riots, uh, kind of occupation at uh, um, the uh, parks kind of in downtown Manhattan, you know, back in like the early 2010s. And, uh, you know, I have a bunch of these like on site drawings I did while I was there and in the margins, I would write a lot of overheard conversations I had from people. And it's kind of funny to me because a lot of the things that are going on right now, it just seems like that sort of thing died out a little bit and it was kind of simmering under the surface. And I think the whole George Floyd situation, I think erupted a lot of those things back into the public consciousness and was kind of a spark that kind of lit that fire back up. So I think a lot of like people see some of the things like the looting happening and don't really understand how it's connected. But I was like, I think it's a lot of that economic tension that was existing from a few years ago, kind of sparking back up again. And uh, I think viewed from that sort of perspective, it makes a lot more sense. But uh, I mean, that's just my personal take on it. But um, I can complete that. I'm in California. You can't march five steps down the street without hearing someone throw out communism or Marxism. And I'm a 
college student too. So those ideas are being thrown out constantly and you're confronted with them a lot. And I think the economic disparity between different classes of people is being exemplified now, especially with the whole pandemic thing. Like you had the stimulus checks going out. You had a lot of people who were suddenly like, me personally, I was working at a college when the whole thing happened and I essentially lost my job. They were like, okay, so you're working this many hours a week. We're going to go ahead and cut that by like 90%. If you want to take these, you can. And I'm like, okay, um, I'm okay. No, you become a a lot more aware of those, uh, especially economically speaking. I think a lot of the people who are supporting uh, like the Black Lives Matter stuff and the rioting, a lot of those are people who are disenfranchised. A lot of people who don't have access to health care or whatever. That was their expression so, of all of it. In a lot of ways, you know, and rightly so in a lot of ways. I think sometimes people's uh, kind of frustrations don't exactly hit the mark. But, you know, there are there's definitely economic justice. There's social issues going on, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think... Uh, maybe people aren't hitting the right mark as far as, you know, they're treating the symptoms, not the actual sickness. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. I mean, just watching everything kind of unfold and being reminded again of the uh, Kali Yuga age and thinking back on cycles that we go through historically. I mean, every empire that has existed has experienced stuff like this, has experienced, uh, I actually just saw a post on social media that was kind of comparing a lot of the stuff that's happening now with uh, what was going on in France before the whole revolution that cut everybody's heads off, changed the months and all that stuff. Um, Yeah, it's funny too. I was actually uh, just recently reading back on um, some kind of short notes about like the short time where the anarchists kind of ran, uh, you know, an area of France and whatnot and like what that sort of small era was like. And then when the communists and the kind of more anarcho- um, uh, pockets started warring against one another once things kind of settled down a little bit and they started pointing fingers at one another. Really interesting. Well, it's very fascinating because uh, people follow patterns, like just historically, and these systems of economics that we have, systems of order, they're basically created to crumble. That seems to be the case every single time. There's always something that kind of snakes its way in, and I think that something is just human nature. Like it's something 100%. that. I, I, it's difficult to look back at history and to look at things now and be like, what's happening? It's like, well, people are happening. Human nature is happening. It's unfolding right before your eyes. I don't understand the surprise. Like it, just take a look at any history book. You'll see a lot of these same cycles happening cycles of like golden ages and production and revolution and technological advancement. And then the subsequent down trade like there's always a trade-off it always falls off at some point and i think in a, in a lot of ways though we are still in a, in a type of golden age but um you know i think that a lot of the recent technological sort of stuff i think people still don't understand like the impact of some of these things like i mean us being on a zoom call right now from opposite ends of the country i think i even touched on this idea in the last podcast i did with you but i really do um believe that technology is like this big game changer in human evolution. It's also something Nietzsche talked about and that sort of thing. Um, But I think that we're going through a kind of period that in the thick of it is really hard to see for what it is. But I think down the line, you know, maybe 100, 150, 300 years from now, people are going to look at back at this kind of point in time as a very turbulent yet transformative and evolutionary time for uh, humankind. And I mean, you know, this country, whatever, you know, people, everything. Well, I think you actually posted something on social media not too long ago where you were talking about the boom that has happened in e-commerce, like just how everything has skyrocketed over the past uh, year or so. And it was already rising before then, but now that people are- Yeah, it was on a steady climb, but I think there was like something like a 260, I wrote the, um, in the post you're referring to, the uh, the actual amount, but I think they said it was like a two hundred and sixty percent increase in e-commerce or something like that. That's you know? insane. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like that that is the way forward. You, you see a lot of businesses closing down because they can't compete with companies like Amazon or like just online and, shopping as a whole. It's funny because a few years ago, I remember reading um, a book by Tim Ferriss called uh, "The Four Hour Workweek." I don't know if you ever picked mm-hmm. that one up, yeah. but um, in it, he talks basically the whole beginning premise of the book is talking about different ways that you can step by step 
basically trick your boss into letting you work remotely and then basically you can get to that point where you're like sipping margaritas on the beach and answering emails for like hr or whatever for like this corporate firm that you work for or whatever um but it was this whole like you know basically advocating for and and showing ways that working remotely can work better than working in an office or something like that and i think a lot of the ideas while executed not in the way that he predicted um are coming true because i think that in a lot of ways we need to have this shift of where maybe that model of you go and you sit in a cubicle all day and pretend to look busy is not the best way of working and structuring a society i think it's a lot of like people wasting their entire lives let alone useful labor sitting there just collecting a paycheck staring at the wall and punching a clock pretending like they're doing something while i don't know you know dicking around on ebounds world or something Oh, I'm feeling that a lot. I mean, I got lost my other job and then I got hired at a uh, warehouse. So I'm working out of there right now. And it's been a great opportunity and whatnot, but I see the degradation and people who have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, they're physically falling apart. Their will is just like hanging on by the, the slimmest of threads. And it just, you look at them and the life is just drained from their eyes. And then this whole pandemic thing hit and for my orientation, now all of a sudden we're receiving a Zoom call from someone who's doing everything from home with her brand new son that was born like two months ago. She's with Which her I family. Love seeing. I mean, personally, I mean, every, every time I talk about it, I, I hear a million um, sort of school teachers frothing at the mouth, but I was really disappointed with the public school system having gone through it. I went to a uh, decent sort of um, public school out here in New York and uh, growing up, and I just think it was a waste of time. I mean, you know, uh, then going through community college was also a little better, but still mostly a waste. And then it wasn't until I went to a very expensive, very prestigious private school that I thought I actually started getting down to business and like kind of fulfilling my potential. And like, you know, I think personally that public school was a waste of time and it did a lot to indoctrinate and teach you how to fall in line and like basically take a bunch of rambunctious ADHD children and keep them locked up in these like buildings during the time where they're the most hardest to handle and, uh, you know, allow their parents to go be workforce slaves and go sit in that cubicle and stare at the wall. Maybe in this sort of way, you know, they could actually get a real education on things that actually work from home by their parents. And, you know, their parents could spend more time with them. And, you know, like me personally, I don't, I don't really, um, I think I would have a different skill set to sort of uh, teach a family member who was growing up than they would teach maybe at a public school, you know, me having grown up to become a kind of entrepreneur and an artist and that sort of thing. And also like having a, a, a spiritual path that like is kind of foreign and beyond what I think mainstream America and the status quo kind of accepts, you know, I mean, we've talked about kind of the uh, inability of Christianity to kind of keep mainstream people sort of engaged and excited about their own spirituality. And, uh, you know, I think, homeschooling and those sorts of things and not relying so much on the public school system gives you a unique uh, sort of opportunity to kind of return back to that and get a little bit of that back into people and maybe we might end up being more uh competent um and capable uh human beings at the age of 18 when you come out of like school years and able to go out into the world and actually do something uh, i there's definitely a connection between like mainstream religions in America and really globally mainstream religions, the school system and the work system, like those three components of society, which is where most people kind of fall under. You only have a couple, a few selected that ended up making it to the top of the heap who can really choose to live life on their own terms. But for the rest of us, we are equally informed by our religious system, which enforces the worker mentality of get done with public school and sign basically your, your life away to a different company and to work for them for the rest of your life. Once you get there though, and like I, I can remember too, is relatively recently for me, only a few years ago when I found myself starting community college, not really having any idea of what I wanted to do because I was informed by a system that didn't really set me up to discover myself. It set me up to discover what the inside of a cubicle looked like or how to be a good worker and things like that. And only once I was able to like, still being a young guy, I'm still analyzing a lot of the things that I was grown up and taught and realizing how inaccurate a lot of those things, like a lot of those uh, societal notions are 
um, knowing that I don't want to work at a company for the rest of my life. I want to pave my own way, especially with the way things now with the boost in e-commerce and things like that. I think it's more important now than ever to inform the younger generation how to use things like Adobe, how to set up technology to record and do things like this, uh, more so than uh, Pythagorean's theorem and things, things like that. These are things and tools that I'm using every single day. And like in a lot of ways, even starting a, even the traditional aspects of starting your own business that have been the same way for the past couple decades were completely alien to me on a point that like, it's almost infuriating how little information we're given that's actually useful in this world. I mean, tons of people start small businesses all the time. The fact that there was nothing covered in public school about how to start your own business, which in, in essentially like a lot of ways, this was starting this tattoo shop was a lot like starting, I don't know, a, an on the books landscaping business or, you know, your own coffee shop or your own hardware store or, or anything, you know, your own laundry mat, whatever, like, it doesn't matter. But like, I, w you were never taught in public school how to like begin and start your own business. You're basically taught how to show up on time, sit down, shut up, do the thing that's put in front of you, go home at X time, you know, take your lunch, don't be a minute over, that kind of thing, you know? And, and like, if we find out you're fucking using any extracurricular substances, you're fucking out of here. You're done. You're excommunicated. And again, excommunicated the same way the Catholic Church would excommunicate someone, a gay person, 2,000 years ago. You're excommunicated. Those same religious standards are being held in the business world, too. I mean, show up, listen to what we have to say, repeat what we have to say. You can ask questions, but not too many because the HR will get on you or whatever. Like a lot of these same standards are reinforced in the business world. And once you kind of find yourself, like I'm sure you've experienced this too, finding out like, okay, I don't really fit into what is being taught to me here. I need to create my own way. I need to find my own path. And only when you make that determination, do you find out like, oh, wow, um, I don't have a clue as to what's going on right now. I don't have a clue as to how to get started or where to go. You just have to pick a direction and, and move. But even in moving, even in picking your own path and choosing to go down, you find yourself confronting different parts of your past that you're like, hey, this belief that I have isn't actually a part of me, but this is something I was raised to believe in. And you kind of have to continue to work on yourself as you go down. Like it's never a finished product. It's something that you always have to work on. 100%. And I find that too, like, every time you think that you've been reborn and ditched that kind of like baggage that you had prior, you hit a certain mark where you can't seem to get past it. And then all of a sudden, you have to go back and start doing that shadow work again, and kind of figuring out like, what kind of shit am I still dragging around? And then you have to kind of go to work and kind of try and saw that kind of programming or that kind of trauma or whatever that thing that's holding you up to achieving that ne next level in your own personal evolution. And, and I find time and time again, every time I think that like, Oh, okay. I finally like ditched all that shit in the past that like you might be able to sustain growth for a little while, but you're always going to hit a certain wall to where you have to look backwards and figure out what things need to die off, what things need to be closed in the casket and let to lay to lay to rest. Oh, and uh, zombification definitely happens in that case. Something you think you laid to rest is like, okay, hey, I'm back now. Oh, I back. think <laughs> I definitely, I, I think one of the things that, again, the past year has shown me is just how deep a lot of those things go. You know, you fight like last year when I started this whole thing and I actually started seeing a little bit of success from it. I was like, wow, I have my own thing. I'm good to go. Like I'm a new, okay, same, I'm new person. This is a part of my personal evolution. I'm going to keep going. Once you keep going, certain problems start popping up. Basically, life continues to happen. And you're like, oh, okay. There's a lot more baggage that I was carrying around that I wasn't initially aware of. That's one of the things doing this has taught me. But it also showed me that the thing that I'm doing, that being you know, beyond the wells idea, the core of it is the pursuit of knowledge and being willing to sacrifice something for it. Being willing to sacrifice comfort. Being willing to sacrifice uh, opinions of others, which is a big one. Now you're out here talking about uh, things that are definitely off the beaten path, like spiritually, religiously, and just generally how you view the world. You're going to get criticism for it and all that. 
a question for you. Did you come up with the name for the podcast because of uh, Odin plucking his eye and throwing it into the well? Yeah. Was that the, uh, the sort of, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the sacrifice for knowledge and everything like that. It kind of, that was immediately came to mind when you said that. Yeah, I think uh, that that's exactly what happened. I remember when I was thinking of idea, I kind of just had words and I had a concept, but I wasn't too sure as to like, okay. And I just sat around and thought about it. And I thought back to that story um, of Odin sacrificing a physical part of himself uh, to access Mimir's well and to be able to obtain the knowledge in that well. And that was really what stuck out to me is being able to obtain knowledge, but you have to sacrifice something for it. Again, that give and take. And I think yeah, that, and, and uh, Mimir being a giant, you know, a thirst himself, kind of demanding of Odin, this god of order, that he kind of commit an act of chaos and in ripping his own eye out and throwing it into the well and kind of like dipping his foot into that waters of, of, of chaos in order to spark and create the sort of agitation that is essential for him to grow and ascend to that next level of knowledge. That's like you know, there's layers of meaning in all of this stuff. And it's hilarious to me when you, you meet people who don't find the potency and the, and the wellspring of kind of symbolic knowledge that, that can be found in these sort of myths and that's the sort of stuff. Oh, definitely. I, I, the past uh, year or so, actually several years, um, I had taken a look back at the belief system that I was raised with, like Christianity, and I opened up the books and I was looking at it. And not only did I find that it was a lot less poetic, than a lot of the myths and legends and whatnot. But I attended church with my family my whole life growing up and I started doing it again. I was like, let me see what these people are actually talking about. Let's see what they had to say. And a lot of it was so just surface level. And again, it, I, I started seeing the connection with uh, a lot of the work that I was doing, like working in restaurants or whatever, and starting, starting to see the similar structure. It's like you have a manager that can be the priest or the cardinal. And the same structure goes all the way down. And this isn't a structure or a belief system or a spiritual path that is meant to reinforce your own growth. It's meant to be one of submission. It's meant to be one of not self-discovery, but again, submission. Yeah. And I mean, there's hidden layers to Christianity too. I feel like, you know, when I read, you know, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, doesn't matter. It's like a lot of the mainstream new age, newer, I don't, um, not new age, uh, newer, mainstream christianity you know when you go to a church and you hear the priest speaking a lot of it is very surface but like you read the source material especially the stuff that hasn't been edited a, a ton and a lot of it seems like there is layers to it and some of it i even can I'll find myself picking up on like a hidden message that they're kind of pointing to and i might not agree with it i might almost be like i see what you're doing there motherfucker you know <laughs> and a lot of it's like you know especially in the old testament you have like these kind of things where things are in the way that satanists are kind of like said to just invert a lot of aspects of christianity as a kind of insult you find all these cases of christians and jews doing that for pagans just oh, yeah. taking pagan traditions and stuff like that and inverting them and almost going like a nah, 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 on the pagans of their time you know well because yeah that's what you can do when you have castles and stuff and more power than they do and yeah exactly it's just an inversion of different values the devils of today, well, the devils of yesterday, the gods of today, and kind of back and forth. Like that's. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, working within the Goetia a lot, the Lesser Key of Solomon, which, you, you know, obviously is linked to the Old Testament, you know, the biblical Solomon and that kind of stuff. But um, if you go through those 72 demons and those spirits that are in there, and you start doing research on some of these entities, a lot of them, they're just lost to time kind of the uh where the source material for a lot of these beings came from but many of them are easily traced back to different pagan gods from conquered lands and conquered cultures that christianity came through and they just turned the old gods into demons and you know you'll find a lot of magicians such as myself and occultists today go back and basically try and unravel and see beyond the mask that that like christianity has placed on a lot of these entities throughout the ages and kind of be like all right what's the essential um pure being of of this entity that has been sort of demonized marginalized um by uh christian dogma throughout the ages i think that could easily be applied to a lot of the social dogmas that have taken place as well we're starting to see with uh, our generation the uh, demonization 
of things like homosexuality and uh, interracial uh, relationships and things that were demonized for a very long time, even slavery a couple hundred years ago, which was justified in texts like the Old Testament and even given directions for it. You're starting to see a lot of those same uh, dogmas being stripped back and you're actually left sitting with either, okay, this is a, a demon that was once a pagan god. You're looking at it for what it is. And we're also starting to see people who are in interracial relationships or gay marriages or whatever. We're starting to see them for what they are too. Past the dogma, past the mask that I think that the Abrahamic religions as a whole have placed on not just us, but the world. We're starting to see past that veneer now. Yeah, human nature and all that sort of stuff, you know, just being able to see ourselves as as uh, animals and not this sort of like exception to all the rules and, and this sort of thing that like has to make all these kind of weird, weird quirky, sleight of hand, uh, ethical and moral sort of things. And because like we're special in the cosmos and therefore like we have to make all these unnatural bends and contortions all the time to fit the kind of Christian moral view and, and the dogma and to live within those sorts of things. And I think um, this kind of apocalypse, and I use that word intentionally, that's kind of going on um, of revelation and humankind awakening to just the kind of slavery and shackles that we've been in for all these centuries and kind of then experiencing a kind of vacuous hole but then also having this kind of anxiety of how to fill it and where can we go from here and i think a lot of um what i feel is that we're at this point of also trying to dismantle the things from the past while also then having that task of filling it with something new uh, figuring out where's the direction that we go from here. Uh, what's this new human going to look like, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, I mean, personally, reading things like Nietzsche and you come across his sort of thoughts on the Ubermensch and that sort of thing, or, you know, Crowley's writing on redesigning the tarot and that kind of stuff. And, and all these occultists that have been pointing towards this new evolution and age of man. Um, it's very interesting being in this kind of threshold, very, uh, kind of murky brackish water in uh, the human timeline. Uh, you start to see as well that a lot of the institutions that we were brought up in, and again, with all the economic crises and things like that, that are being reawakened, you start to see how those instruments of the government were used as instruments of control, the same way that religions have been used as instruments of control too. Once you start stripping that away, language has been a, and has been used to control. And I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of uh, hokey pokiness around language lately, trying to control the way people talk and and uh, speak with one another and say things online and you know censoring certain types of speech and words and that kind of stuff to f basically alter people's political uh, and lives and agendas and that sort of thing. And the way that people think, you know, that's a form of control as well, as much as these people, I think masquerade that they're um, kind of uh, all about um, freedom and acceptance and these sorts of things. But, you know, again, you see just somebody, there's a bit of a power grab going on. I think, you know, even if it's subconscious and a lot of people don't realize it, uh, there's a hole created here and, you know, some people who might even be parading themselves as victims are going to try and pick up the power and kind of be the new slave masters. Again, just trading power and control back and forth, because ultimately that's kind of what it comes down to, is uh, whether this group is in power, they eventually fall out of power, and then they, they become the slaves of tomorrow. That's just kind of how a lot of this stuff seems to go. And likewise, with economic systems, uh, capitalism, communism, whatever you want to put it, those same instruments of human nature permeate through those systems. Cause again, they were made by people. And I think when yep. you start to see the systems collapse, whether they be religious or economic systems, you start to recognize like, okay, these, these are just things people made. It's the, the old the joke day. about like, if you keep going through failed relationships over and over and over again, and you keep blaming it on everybody else. Like eventually you have to admit that it's you. It's like, you know, through all these like great economic and, and societal increases and then falling to pieces, it's like, well, humans have been involved in every single one. So, you know, maybe it's just fucking us. Maybe we're just human beings and that's what we do. And I think uh, to illustrate that point a little bit more, like recently reading through a lot of Christopher Hitchens work and listening to debates and lectures, I too love like uh, Nietzsche and a lot of those same um, philosophers from that time period. 
uh, even the old Stoics or whatnot. Their perspectives are incredible. But even reading something as recent as like Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great from like 2007, and looking at it from like a modern perspective and seeing how he basically just takes this lofty spiritual system that has been around for thousands of years and has been in control for so long, just takes it and strips it all away and makes it so apparent that this is just something that people use to get power from one another. This is just something that people use to control basically that that's all it comes down to is control controlling the resources controlling the population controlling the wealth whatever it is that you want to control it's been an excellent instrument to use in order to control but like you said yeah, and i mean there's no real way around it that's just how we function as human beings you know this sort of utopian idea that like we could get away from violence and power systems and those sorts of things it's not really like a possibility as human beings you know it's um whether you want to blame it on the demiurge or something like that but it's just like i mean even the uh the, the hindu texts you know say and as much as people think the hindus are, are these flowery you know nice uh, peace loving people. I mean, it's, it's in the books that this is not a place where utopia could ever exist. You know, um, this human existence, this human experience, this, uh, you know, we are spiritual beings having a, a physical experience. And because of that, this material plane is not some place where those sorts of utopian ideas could ever manifest and be created for any meaningful stretch of time. Um, you know, it's like you try and do as best as you can. You try and uh, chase ideals, even though they might not be achievable. But at the end of the day, I think that um, there's a type of fanaticism that uh, allows you to um, mass slaughter tons of people when you start thinking that those sorts of utopias are actually achievable or uh, you justify sort of any action to get there. Uh, immediately, you spoke about the Hindu texts, not necessarily, or just Hindus in general. Uh, being portrayed especially in like the new age a lot of a positive and very uplifting and uh, it's exotic yeah very exotic and flowery aspects of it are being flaunted but i remembered i uh, was remembering the uh, robert oppenheimer quote when he saw the bomb drop like now Absolutely. i am become death the destroyer of worlds which is a direct quote from uh, the bhagavad Shiva. gita yeah yep. and it was incredible to think about how again this spiritual system was intertwined with this instrument of destruction that we now have access to again products of human nature the cycle continues which is a real big aspect of hinduism as a whole and i think uh one of the things that i would ask you is how do you in this the kali yuga age everything that's been going down all the trans transformations and dogmas being stripped away which has been a gradual process it's nothing like entirely new but how do you and your work fit into all of that as an occultist, as a magician, as a tattoo artist, all of that? How does that fall into the, this age that we're now living in? I mean, dude, I just try and shoot from the hip. Honestly, man, you know, like I try and not fall into too much. Uh, you know, again, a lot of the floweriness of the of the new age way of thinking. I think that there's like, you know, I'm, an, I'm, I'm typically a pretty positive guy, I would think most people would say. But, you know, I think that my philosophy is always rooted in a kind of existentialism, you know, that kind of like nihilism that you wake up to that eventually you get to that existential idea of that basically you're in control. And, you know, living like a victim is a choice. And I think personally, you know, realizing that I could become the architect of my own existence through magic, through witchcraft, through these sorts of things. I try and just be a living embodiment of these things to give you an example. And then um, to try and uh, be a vessel for those sorts of like higher ideals that I see and um, allow them to kind of speak through me and be a living example so that others might, you know, get turned on to something that might therefore allow them to not just be sacrifices to the demiurge of misery and woe that I think that this modern world creates this whole existence. I mean, go back 3000 years, the Buddha was saying life is suffering. This place is designed for us to suffer. And out there, there is some parasitic deity that is basically eating your suffering and wanting you to be fertilizer for his cause, you know? And for me, everything that I do, all this joyous ecstatic existence and molding and creating artwork out of, this sort of bad deck of cards that we've all been given, that I've been given everything, is to spit in the face of everything that wants me to be miserable and 
worrisome and downtrodden and to feel like a victim, you know? So the best I could do is again, be a vessel of conquest and ec ecstasy and trying to, again, live in spite of all the things that want you to push you away from living in that sort of life. So what you're saying is you're a little bit of a rebel is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's an excellent way to put it. I mean, just, just living as a living, breathing example of being a rejection of the, the, not just, okay, the system, but the will that we have within us that wants to create, that wants to push forward, that wants to create a foundation and be an example. I, I think that's one of the most noble pursuits and just about everybody I've had questions or I've asked that question to and had conversations with. That's ultimately what it comes down to is wanting to be an example, even in the and, age of destruction and death to, to live past you. And there's, there's two sorts of, I think, um, reactions you could have to this modern Kali Yuga age. And I think both are valid. And this is a conversation I have a lot with, you know, friends of mine who may be full on different, uh, on the other side of this coin, I think than I do. Um, you know, there's this, reaction that that kind of retreating to the woods trying to live off the land be a person of another age and kind of like reject the modern world by not living and refusing to be a part of it um i think that that is a very valid and sort of logical and healthy response to i think the modern world that we live in the other one i think which is more where i fall on is trying to be in this world but not of it you know trying to you know can you, you know, being a soldier in trying to figure out, hey, can you find enlightenment while driving around nice cars, making money and living and pursuing these sorts of like sensory pleasures and that sort of thing, but not being too attached to them? I think that that's the way that the kind of tantric left hand path sort of operates in a lot of ways. And I think it kind of disrupts their regularly scheduled program of the kind of meek and celibate sort of monkish uh image that people have of a holy person mostly predicated by their misunderstandings of eastern theology uh and practice and what that looks like and also christian sort of like meek and uh modest um way of being and that's the way that a man of god uh sort of um acts or something like that or that's the way a spiritual person acts you know breaking that kind of stuff and uh not kind of falling to that and you know they think that you have to be necessarily peaceful and kind and agreeable all the time and that that's what a spiritual person looks like you know i think that that's something that needs to be broken and i think very much has a lot of room to grow in this kind of modern era I think when it comes to like the bastardization of Eastern philosophy, a lot of people will take that uh, kind, easygoing and kind of agreeable nature as being someone who doesn't have a spine. When in fact, yeah. you're talking to someone who has had these conversations thousands of times and they realize they perhaps can't reach you. So they just accept what's in front of them and move forward. Doesn't mean it is, that doesn't mean they agree with you. What it, all it means at the end of the day is that they understand and have a higher level of wisdom and knowledge as to, where to direct their attention and where to spread it being they're agreeable gardener, not having yeah, go ahead they're a gardener of their own internal landscape and they kind of realize they cannot control the weeds that you have in your garden exactly and that doesn't translate into they stand for nothing and they they are nothing like no they know who they are so they realize they don't have to stand with you or against you they get to choose they get to pick and choose what they stand or for. where their will and their sphere of influence is most effective which is in things that they can control, which is within their own sphere. Exactly. They have a different level of knowledge. And I, that perspective kind of gets left a little bit because you, when you think of a, an Eastern philosopher, like a monk or something like that, you think of someone who's very peaceful and very tranquil. It's like, I think you ask them themselves, they would say, no, uh, this has been the product of years and years and years of learning how to turn the turmoil that I experience every day, that everyone experiences every day, and learning how to turn that into something other than turmoil, learning how to tame it, learning how to live with it and to work with it. And I think artists do the exact same thing. Artists, writers, uh, painters, whatever it is that you do, you take that turmoil and you translate it to the world and you have something to show for it. The same way someone meditates kind of does. World. You kind of create a kind of world with its own, its own uh, rules, its own sort of functions and that sort of thing. And you try and allow that world to live in and, in and on its own. 
and maybe its influence can bleed out a little bit, but in a lot of ways you're containing, you're making your own container and sort of uh, miniature where, you know, you can play out things and, and, and play with ideas and, and, and give those things a space. Absolutely. I think uh, to close this whole conversation out, I think, uh, of course, we were speaking a little while ago about the, the name Beyond the Well, where it came from and being willing to sacrifice something in order to obtain knowledge, to obtain wisdom or whatever it is that you're pursuing. As an artist, tattooer, everything that you've done, what do you think you sacrifice in order to live the life the way that you do? Uh, I mean, dude, I think a lot of people don't realize how much work day in, day out it kind of is. And I mean, like, I, I had a conversation, I mean, recently where I was talking about that, like, I think 40 hours a week is for office workers, you know? Uh, I think if you're going to be a professional artist for a living, you should really expect to work like 60, 70 hours a week plus, you know, you should expect and, and work-life balance becomes non-existent because, you know, it's not really something you shut off when you go home. It's, it's not really something that ever really shuts off. You know, you're basically taking your home life and your work life and they're becoming merged in one. And I think that that's the case for entrepreneurs as well. It makes me happy to be an artist entrepreneur and not somebody trying to peddle, I don't know, uh covid masks or like toothpicks or like you know i don't know brakes for cars or something like that that i don't really care about because i think that that work-life balance inherently gets kind of violated and and dissolves so i'm happy that i've kind of found my way and been able to make a business out of something that i genuinely love and enjoy uh so yeah i think that that's kind of the uh misunderstanding there is that you know that you could possibly have that sort of balance or anything like that resembling that in any sort of way and, and that can be uh, contrasted as well like the way that you've chosen to live and the fact that you've sacrificed like example work home life balance that kind of thing you can translate that i can speak from my own experience too like working where i'm working now and again seeing people with the life sucked out of them and their work home life balance is basically non-existent, but that's because they're being forced to work overtime six days out of the week. Like they don't yeah. get to live. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when you do go out into the world, I think, you know, there's that, that kind of common uh, trope talking about the wolf in sheep's clothing. And I mean, if you really think the sheep are fooled by the wolf's clothing, you know, they're definitely not. So I think, you know, at some point as a, as a kind of wolf among sheep, you know, with the herd, you kind of stop even putting on the kind of dressing and trying to act like a sheep. And I think when you go out into public and you're, and you're mixing with these kind of people, they can smell it on you immediately that there's something different. There's mm -hmm. something like you're not living by the rules. You're not playing by their same deck of cards, that sort of thing. And I think a lot of people even more so are put off by that. And I think you have to get right with the fact that like, you're not, you're kind of putting yourself on the other team. You know, in a lot of ways, I think that like the artist, the outlaw, the criminal, the, those sorts of things, they have a lot more in common than I think, you know, people would like to admit and that sort of thing, because you're not going by the same set of rules that everybody else is going on. And I think that a lot of artists get themselves in trouble by still trying to cling to the fact that they uh, want to be accepted by the greater sort of, outer world and the status quo and all these sorts of things and be lovey-dovey cuddled and, and, and accepted amongst those types of people, you know? It was ultimately what you are at the end of the day, more so than a, a wolf or a sheep even. You're somebody who doesn't have to walk around denying any aspects of themselves. You fully embrace it and you're in an environment and you earn a living and basically get to live life on your own terms because of the fact that you don't deny yourself, that you work and do the things that you're passionate about, you create the things that you're passionate about, and you have an audience of people who respect that and want that from you, people who are also out doing the same thing. It's impossible to be like part of the herd when the herd has been taught and programmed to deny important aspects of who they are in order to get to their 12-hour shift on Tuesday, in order to get through their 60-hour work week, which is what you're working too, but you're working without any blinders on. You're not working on a machine that you have no personal connection to. You are extending your personality onto a page 
onto a keyboard, onto someone's skin, whatever it is. Absolutely. It's a full on expression of exactly who you are. And I found that with this, an extension of who I am speaking and having dialogues and discussing weird things like economic collapses and uh, Nietzsche and whatnot. Yeah, dude, it's, I'm happy to see it. I'm happy to see you back. I'm, and I'm really excited that you asked me to be on and everything like that, man, because I support the hell out of what you're doing. I really appreciate And a brief note on that as well. Like, I can't express gratitude enough for people like you and uh, others in like primarily the Operation Werewolf Network who have reached out uh, the past couple of weeks since everything got rolling again. And I've been showing an incredible amount of support. You know, like I was had it in the back of my head, like, hey, you chose to take eight, nine months off because of other circumstances that were going on. That's fine. That's cool. But you also can't expect a whole lot coming back to it. You're going to have to work your way back up. And I'm fully willing to do that. I'm going to. But just the outcry of support has been incredible. And I want to thank you personally for all of that and whatever it is. The loose knit kind of inner circle of everything. I mean, like, it's a broad thing, but there's a lot of, you know, um, Taurus, you know, to quote something that Paul's used in the past. Uh, but I think that the kind of tight, it, it's a tight but loose sort of inner circle um, is very supportive. And I think, you know, they, they recognize what you're doing and everything like that. And I'm sure it's not surprising to me that people are like, you know, hyped to see you back and, and doing everything. Um, just also, dude, uh, I'm, I'm going to be in Los Angeles at the end of uh, October if you'd like to meet up and stuff. Uh, probably that last week there, I'll be there for Halloween and whatnot. So I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here. So of course, yeah. just, just throw it out there. Let me know, dude. So where can anybody, I'm sure they already know, but where can anybody find you on social media, your work and all that? Um, I'm uh, at Biker Witch Tattooer. Um, that's uh, B-I-K-E-R under, uh, B-I-K-E-R-V-V-I-T-C-H underscore tattooer on Instagram. I have a link tree on there in my bio. You can find all my other things from YouTube to Twitter to uh, my TikTok, uh, which I've been hitting TikTok really hard the last uh, few months. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun doing that, um, which is really funny too. I really enjoy that a lot of people give me a lot of shit for being on TikTok. I think it's hilarious and it just makes me want to be on there even more. Um, but yeah, as for now, I haven't gotten banned off of every single platform and gone to uploading on Pornhub. So if that does happen, you could find me there. But otherwise, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. I'd say Instagram and TikTok predominantly, but I've got other links you could find on the Instagram page. Uh, TikTok, you really are a rebel. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for coming on here again. It's always a joy having you on and talking to you. I'll definitely be seeing you here in uh, October. I'll be here. Awesome. See you then, Austin. Take it easy, Pat. Be well, bud.